Alright, I'm, I'm recording uh, 10 seconds of you because I just want to hear what So if you want to tell me that, and in a regular voice, that Tom is a junkie and a sellout. Tom Dell is a junkie and a sellout. And he ashamed of himself. Tom Dell is a junkie and a sellout. The man should be ashamed. Okay. Wrong. You know, as you know, cake costs me three bucks an hour. So it's not like, you know, if we pause or if we jerk around or anything. <laughs> if I get one good statement out of you, you know, the hour is not wasted. Plus, <laughs> it's memories of Luke back when he had his hair. Yeah, it will be gone soon enough. Well, because you, you, you also have to suffer from the works coast. Pattern baldness? Yeah, the the co the off pattern baldness. Well, look at Owen. Look at look at uh, Matt. Look at I mean. It's only we don't know where Liam is. He could be bald as a cue ball. We have no idea. Dave, Dave could probably look like Mister like, like Professor X. <laughs> All right, so but he has the same power, so it's okay. <laughs> what is Professor X's power? Now? He had he could he had like telekinesis or he was psychic or something. I don't know. I think Dave can probably reset a modem from fifty paces or something. When, um, all right, so, so for you, BBSs are like, like you said, 87, probably about 93. I would assume that it kind of coincides with ATDT's death. I, I would say maybe a little bit later, because I, I was still calling places up until I moved to California, which was in basically the end of 1996. I mean, I wasn't calling a lot of places, because most of the places that I frequented were gone by that time. I mean, that was, that was the end as far, I mean, as far as, you know, I was concerned. I moved on um, to things on the Internet, really. I mean, I had been on the internet fairly early anyway, but uh, I was also on BBS. You know, is uh, now is there a one? Is there a specific BBS for you that represents the BBS? The works. It's got to be the works. Um, the works took me from a mewling babe and made me into the man I am today. What about the works was good? Um. I think it was the people. It was the people on the, the on the works, um, primarily. Um, <laughs> there was also the fact that you uh, uh, didn't just kick me off when I was an idiot when I was 17. <laughs> you, in fact, were like, you, uh, as I recall, you, you threatened to kick me off, and then the next day made me a cosis off. <laughs> I just like that that's the two extremes. Like, it was one option or the other. But, uh... Um, you know, all kidding aside, as as melodramatic as this may sound, I don't think I would be the same person that I am today. Um, certainly not without BBSs in general, um, and definitely I don't think with the works without the works either. Uh, the, the works is often called the hacker finishing school by most. Uh, <laughs> I like that. I hadn't heard that before. Yes, it's actually. Uh, I think our, our our full page spread in Boardwatch and in uh, 2600 called us the hacker finishing school. <laughs> We'll make um, you elite. Yeah, you know, there wasn't really any intention for the works to be a hacker BBS initially. It just came out that way, mm -hmm. I guess, later with the text files. Well, even, even then, it was like, although there were hackers on the works, and, and I remember thinking, like, oh, we should make this, like, a more elite hacker BBS and, and have, like, a login password and stuff like that. But it was, it was more just... The works is almost... It ran sort of... It's similar to CDC, where, in my mind, anywhere anyway, where it's something that may be made up of a lot of people who are part of the hacking scene, but this is not specifically, um, the works was not specifically geared toward that. I'm trying to think how to, to say that better. Um, sort of like CDC is made up of people who are involved with the computer underground, but that is not necessarily um, the, the outlet for the, that part of their talent. You know, Well, I'm, I'm trying to congeal the, the thought into... I know what I'm saying, but it's hard to express it. One of the episodes is, is a, a theoretically a, a one called HPBAC, which is the one on the, the idea of the underground BBS. And actually may not be as long as I expect it was going to be. Now, what was the V for in that? Virus. Uh, see, I never, I never proved the virus. Hacking, um, freaking, virus, air conditioning. <laughs> and 
Anarchy and Carney. See, and the works was also the, uh, uh, the, uh, the parent of, of my own short-lived text file group, Lucifer, L-U-C-I-P-H-E-R, which originally was Legion of United Carters, Iguanas, Freaks, Hackers, and Erstwhile Revolutionaries, because we couldn't think of anything that I, to, for I to stand for. But then it was Legion of United Carters International Freaks, Hackers, and Erstwhile Revolutionaries. Um, and produced, I think, five text files before. I think I, I basically joined CDC and threw all my efforts that away. Any thought as to why the need for producing text files on a scheduled basis and releasing them? I don't, for me, it was never a matter of like a scheduled basis. It was just that there was all of this stuff that this creativity that was otherwise going off into the ether and never to be seen of seen again. So there was maybe subconsciously, but there was there was a a, a need to get think put things down on the record to to make our mark on the world. I think. I, I think that Swamp Rat actually talk, says something. I, I wish I could, you know, I had the inf exact quote in front of me, but he says something in, in CDC two hundred that's um, rings very true for me. Um, do you have links on any of this? Yes, but I'm not going to have you. <sighs> Fine. <laughs> no cheat sheets during the interview. It's not cheating, it's uh, an so aid. So it's checking. Yeah. Yeah, well, you know, um, well, first of all, um, I discussed 200 with him because 200 is For me, is, it, it's the epitome of text files for me. To, absolutely. If you had to ask me, one text file that would be my all-time favorite, it would be CDC 200. Um, a close second would probably be The Conscience of a Hacker by The Mentor. And those two files really sum up everything that it meant to be a hacker or and someone involved in computers and, and BBSs in the late 80s, early 90s. The, uh, you know, uh, I talked to The Mentor a little bit about his file. He said he still gets people contacting him all the time. Well, it's just as true now. I mean, it it, it totally has stood up to the st the test of time. Everything in that file is is just as applicable now as it was coming uh, close to twenty years ago when he wrote it. He wrote it in what nineteen eighty six. Yeah. I feel old. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, certainly as time goes on and you move away from PBSs, there are certain aspects of them that continue this time. You know, there's a, there's a strong need by the 1990s for the later text file groups like um, Ho, uh, you know, Hot of Entropy, and Aneda, and so on, who are these ones, to kind of distinguish Oopsie. themselves by ripping on the old ones. And in fact, one of my favorite um, files is a file this guy wrote uh, in which he goes back in time <laughs> And he has to stop the blade and the battalion from blowing <laughs> up the world. And he the like, blade. You know, he, it's, it's basically Back to the Future with text files. And he has to track down the blade. And he's, you know, he's back in 85. And he's got 10 years into the past. I haven't seen that text file, but it sounds like a worthy goal, actually. <laughs> and I gave it to the battalion. Uh-huh. Because he mentioned the battalion. The battalion contacted him. And he was, I saw his response to something like, what's an old part contacting me? He didn't actually... <laughs> the, uh, the, the, the blade and the battalion. But anyway. Um, so, let's see. You know, what, so what I meant was, are there other experiences, kind of people or things that really persist now, 15, 18 years later? I don't I'm not exactly sure what you mean. Uh, BBS, BBS events, BBS situations, things... Things that you, still happen? No, things that... Because when you... All right. You, you serve a certain tour in the Army, mm -hmm. but after a while, the ones that you really remember are like these three or four battles you were in that were really good, uh -huh. and this place that you visited that was really great. You kind of... So so are there specific events that are... Yeah, are there real, some real jewels of memory that, can, that persist with you? Well, for me, I mean, I grew up out in the middle of nowhere, basically, and I was specifically the weird kid in my high school. And 
it wasn't until I started to get involved with BBSs that I realized that there were other people just like me out there. Um, and then I, you know, I started to meet people through that, um, some of whom are still my good friends today, my best friends today, um, even though you know, the computer aspect is something that is very little, if any, you know, it's not really part of it anymore. Um, it's just now we're just friends. Um, but uh, I'm trying to think specific stories. I remember like the the early mo most of the, most of my memories are more things that like happened that you know, in real life or happened in the real world with people that I knew from from online. So I'm not sure how applicable that would be. But um, you know, I were there any events that bridged both that happened? Certainly, I mean, there's certainly like the works, the the works gatherings uh, of Boston were the the specific ones. That's where I, I met you for the first time. I met um, Iskra and Dave Ferret and all those guys and all the people that I knew on the works. Um, and we just go out and, and do things. Initially, we'd go to your house and watch Amiga <laughs> demos and listen to mods, um, and you'd put up with us <laughs> and bait, like all these, you know suburban teenagers um, who didn't have the best social skills <laughs> um, really just sort of taking over your apartment for an evening or two. I, I still re I remember the time that uh, um, my mom demanded to talk to you <laughs> before the, the first time I was, I was going down to Boston to visit you and she gets off the phone with you and she's like, well, your friend Jason sounds like a bullshit artist. <laughs> I was like, yeah, but he's a good guy. Is there a, uh, uh, well, one of, the, one of the themes that I really have encountered in the 150, 160 interviews is actually this whole concept of the, um, the gathering. Um, I've heard them called BBSQs. I've had them called, you know, uh, get-togethers. Uh, there seems to be a natural outgrowth of a bulletin board system. Well, it's, it's, certain, it's true. I mean, you want to meet the people, meet the face behind the monitor. Uh, you want to meet, get to know the people in the real world that you, that you know online. Um, and sometimes it would happen and you would hate the person. Sometimes you turn out to be great friends. Uh, but uh, for us, it was always a matter of, of getting away from, you know, our little disaffected, you know, the disaffected societies that we were coming from to get together with people that we liked and, and uh, had things in common with and, and then just doing whatever, be it like go see a movie or go tunneling at MIT or um, take a bunch of drugs or what, what have you, you know? Um, Talk about blowing shit up. The, uh, there's an interesting you know, phenomenon that you end up being at the center of because right at the end of the real peak of both boards in 92, 93, that's when the major media interest comes along. In BBSs or in stuff that I was involved with? Well, both. Because a lot of the, a lot of the um, information centers for the stuff you were doing was BBSs. Mm -hmm. And I guess the question I'm asking is, is there anything... I mean, you've had dozens of media interviews, and, and focusing on the early ones, not the later, you're like the Woody Allen, and the early funny ones, and stuff, <laughs> and the later serious ones. Is there anything that they always missed when they were trying to get the concept of bulletin boards or that thing? Like something that they just would skim over and they never got? Well, I mean, I don't think it's, I think you're making an assumption that they were trying to get get the idea about behind BBSs, and that was not my experience. My experience was that um, each of those interviews that I, that I did, especially with television, um, they came with a, a distinct agenda. They came with, you know, they wanted, they knew what they wanted to get, and they just wanted to get you to say things so they could edit that or, or make it end up with the goal they had in mind all along. Um, so it's, it's not really like there was a serious like they were seriously trying to learn about BBSs or seriously trying to learn about what was going on in the, in the Hacker Underground. They just wanted to know, uh, they would ask you specific questions geared towards getting an answer that they knew all along they wanted. Was there anything, I'm mostly, I'm asking within the theme of getting this answer out of you, which is, you know, st 
stuff that was back then that you thought was really important that you wish they would ask about? Do you prefer that way? Um, The reason that I did a lot of interviews, I think, was that I felt that there was a tremendous amount of misunderstanding both um, among the, amongst the general, general populace, but specifically amongst law enforcement and the ju judiciary about what exactly was going on with computers and with BBSs. Um, the idea that the police or a judge could expect someone to know every, everything that was in every text file on his BBS um, and would hold that person responsible for that, not understanding that that's like expecting a librarian to know every sentence of every book in their library, um, was something that was was fairly mind-boggling to me and was never really. It, it 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 was never really corrected. It just sort of fell by the wayside with the advent of the internet. There's uh, actually. The Although it it hasn't actually. I mean, you with your judicial. I mean, your your problems with people complaining about files that mention a specific brand of. Cleanser. I mean, they they still hold people responsible for everything that's in that, even though it's it's legal. It's well, the interest is is corporate, and it's not legal. It's trademark dilution, and it's an actual violation of the Lanham Act to say take this product and use it to commit a crime. That's true. I was thinking more specifically of, of parodies, like the parody exception. But in in your specific case, no, that that would. No, the thing where they say, take this and kill people <laughs> with it, that's a problem. Do you know about the mail I sent back to them? Where I said, the first, I, twice I sent mail to them. Once I said, I have taken all occasion of the word works and replaced it with the word cocks. <laughs> and while I'll understand if your client has the trademark on that term too, I will assume for the moment they don't. And then the second one they sent me, I did it again. And I was like, the person mailing me is named Amy. And I see she's doing it, you know, as the secretary of Robin. I can only assume then that Piper Rudnick LLC is composed of beautiful um, lawyer ladies. So <laughs> That's right. You said the, the best the best approach was to hit on the people so serving the time, you. The next time you mail me, you know, I'll feel a rush of passion uh, before the fear. <laughs> anyway. Did you ever hear back from after that? No. It, no. They were like, oh. They never took my bait, which is really sad because I was, you know, I was in the market for Anyway, so you can never have too many. Leaders. They're good loving. Too many. Um, so, you know, is there a... Um, okay, well, let me let me get this focused right here properly. Oh, you look like heaven. Yeah. <laughs> you look like heaven. Um, you know, I should have been more hungover. To right. me, you know, there are very influential BBSs in my life. <coughs> And of course, to, to Sherwood's Forest and right Sherwood Forest and Osani and a lot of those, and then but in my late BBS period, the period just before I drop off completely, the number one influential BBS for me is Argus. Argus, I I don't think was influential for me. It was a major part of my life because it was the first uh, or the largest. It wasn't the very first multi-user like chat line BBS that I called, but it was it was probably the biggest. Um, and this was before IRC. This was, um, it was a, uh, at the same time that we were using QSD and Lutzifer on Telenet, but that was a much more complicated thing and you weren't talking to people local to you on that, you were talking to people in France and, and all over the world. So if I, w I just wanted to talk to people in the Boston area, I would call Argus. Um, as far as other BBSs that were influential for me, the works would undoubtedly be number one. Um, Besides that would be Demon Roach Underground, the head um, CDC board in Lubbock, Texas. Uh, Dark Side of the Moon in Sunnyvale, California. Um, those are probably the, the, two, the two biggest. There were a lot of other, a, a bunch of other sort of associated CDC boards like Tequila Willie's Grand Subterranean Carnival and, and uh, Pure Nihilism, um, The Convent, uh, and things like that that were also... Uh, important, but those were the two main ones. Just to cover this, uh, this sort of subject, um, you know, the, the board you just mentioned by where they're located it is basically on every end of the country. Mm -hmm. Every, <laughs> you know, every aspect of it. So, you know, did you feel that sense of distance or... 
Yes and no. I mean, the the I didn't really because I felt like I was talking to people who were similar to me, and I would only really feel it if they were mentioning things specific to their locality. But none of those BBSs had a, a terribly local clientele or, or member list. There, were, I wasn't the only one calling from the other side of the country. There, there are lots of people. The only time, the only time that it really struck home to me that they were on the other side of the um, country was the first uh, what six hundred dollar phone bill that my parents got, and then there's the whole thing of of oh my god um what am i you know how what am i going to do well i can't stop calling these places i just have to figure out how to do it for free and so that led me down to the road to getting involved in freaking and hacking and things like that mm -hmm. when uh you'll find that i'm just going to keep dancing over hacking because that's okay there's a hundred thousand hours of you and they all suck you know is there one aspect you know when, when people discuss hacking and freaking and stuff is there, you know, it's almost always portrayed as the amount of damage you can do, intentionally or unintentionally, uh -huh. and it's always portrayed as this great secret that children are perpetrating on their parents and society, right? The, it's, a, it's a hidden agenda on the parts of children, or it's a highly destructive force. Or there is a very quick, almost disclaimer-esque kind of thing of saying, well, it's really about, it's, it's as if it's some sort of homeschooling, right? Well, I think there's an aspect of homeschooling to it, it that people are out there learning things on, on their own. I don't think in general that it's, that it's been terribly destructive. There are exceptions to that, certainly, um, be it viruses or people RMing entire systems, things like that. But I think in general, it's... Um, been creative or at least neutral in its effect, uh, but I, I do think that a lot of the most creative people who, behind technology today are a product of of this, you know, society of, of not just the computer underground, but BBSs, things like that coming up. Like you were talking about the guy from uh, CompuGeeks, computer CompuGeeks.net, um, where again, you know, he's made all his money doing that, but he came up through BBSs. There's a strong, um, strong sense I get from people of the influence that BBS holds on them, you know, in their later life in terms of you know, their friends and their things that they learn. Is there any uh, experiences that you've come up with, and this is a off-the-wall question, so I don't mind if it's hard to answer, but are there experiences that were just so unique to the BBS experience that it's basically impossible to translate into Um, there's certainly things that you can't really, no one who wasn't involved in BBS is, gonna, is going to understand. I think that that's commonplace, actually. Like, I'm not going to have a conversation um, with somebody, you know, somebody that I meet in school or at work who had nothing to do with BBSs. I can't have a conversation with them about the BBS experience because they have no frame of reference. That's, they have, you know, they, they may have a dim awareness of what a BBS is, but if they didn't go through that whole thing, grow up with that as part of their life, then, then they'll have no idea what I'm talking about or it won't mean anything to them. Um, so are there in fact, I mean, I'm wondering if you can, I mean, because if there's ever a situation where there is a contextualized conversation that will allow you to describe this and have it make sense, this is it. So, you know, for example, um, one which I've found is like, you know, the 40 column versus 80 column battle, uh, part-time BBSs. No, they're, they're, yeah, definitely. I mean, 40 column versus 80 column, part-time BBSs, baud rate. Like the other day I was having a conversation with somebody about, you know, when we got various speeds of modem and somebody was like, oh, you know, I got a 9600 baud in, in 1991 when, you know, it was the shit. Or like, oh, I was on 2400 baud until, until the very end and, and things like that where it's, it's not going to mean anything to anyone who wasn't there. You know, especially in comparison to the you know cable modem DSL what have you today. Do you think that uh, people are you know uh, you can ask, you, you can decide either way or either you know kids are hurt by not coming up through different boards of the cable modems or if it's good that they start out at you know megabit. Well, it's it's tough. I've actually thought about this a lot because I think that. Um, 
my first my first instinct is to say yes, they're hurt by not coming up through that that um, that they don't have the the richness of experience, the depth depth of experience that, that we did. But then there's other part of me that says, okay, that's just the the cranky old man talking to me, to me talking because it's just the cranky old man talking that. It's like saying, oh, you know, it builds character, and if they haven't gone through that, you know, I had to walk two miles uphill each way to school with nothing but a hot potato in my pocket to keep me warm. You know, it's, it's like that. Um, so I, I don't really know if, if, there's, if there's an answer. I, it's, it is something that I, I have thought about and continue to think about, but I don't know if I've come up with a, a definite answer. I think that, um, you know, I, I wish that I'd had, you know, megabit connections at the very beginning, but I, but I don't wish that I didn't go through the things that I did. I, I don't wish that, um, I'm glad that I, I lived through the BBS, um, the, the golden age of BBSs. Um, and I'm glad that I, that I have those experiences and I wouldn't trade them for, you know, all the high speed internet connections in the world. You're barely 30 now, right? I just turned 30 less than a week ago. Right. So what's your thought about the fact that you have this subcultural thing you were a part of mm -hmm. that, as you described it, makes you a burnt out old man at 30. I think it's weird. I think, it, I, I think it's very strange. But at the same time, then I think about um, things like, okay, you know, this is the 20th anniversary of CDC. That's, you know, this, this year is, I mean, um, that's really, really weird. I wasn't part of it then, you know, I was only 10 years old. But uh, um, it's, it's weird to think about that because 20 years is a long time for anything. I mean, unless you're talking about medieval architecture or geology, 20 years is a big chunk of time. It's a generation. The, the idea, the fact that there are people involved with, um, in the computer underground today who weren't even born yet when I was doing stuff is amazing to me. Somewhat distressing, but amazing. The, uh, um, I'm curious about the Um, I think people a lot, I, I've met people who seem to think of them like they were primitive live journals, like some sort of primitive blogs, um, which I don't think is, is accurate. I think it might be more to, accurate to say that blogs are, are a logical um, evolution of, of BBSs, or at least one aspect of them. I would describe blogs and live journals as BBSs where the only topic of yeah, um, and what the Sysop thinks. I mean, there are online, uh, there are, you know, BBS systems on the web. There are, you know, they call it, I guess, forums is the most common um, name. But maybe I'm not seeing the right ones, but I've never seen one with the same sense of community that um, I saw in BBSs. Do you think any part of that is youth versus experience? In other words, you know, because... Your first experience was, you know, after they've settled the issue of serial port connections and after they've settled the issues of platform, you know, basically, uh, there's only like 68,000 and uh, intels that are basically running the roost up to now, um, you know, that when you start off, that's what it was like for you. So for you, you have a, a whole generation of, of BBSs that you've never That's true. been a part of. That, um, you know, for them, I'm sure, I mean, my theory would be the guys who started out in the 70s think of the stuff that came out in the late 80s as being, you know, the stuff that just doesn't capture the good feeling back in the old days because you didn't, you know, you soldered everything ever trying to make this thing connect to the phone line long enough. I've got people who described to me the first time they got X modem in 79, and they didn't have X modem when they got it, so they had to grab it, then they had to scroll through it on the BBS and compare it and change the bits that had gotten wrong on the way over. See, that, that's hardcore. What I, I, what I remember is using uh, my 300 baud earmuff modem, and I had, X, I had X modem, but I remember spending hours downloading a Y modem, and, or, or downloading a, you know, a, a a 
program that had Y modem as part of it. And I just remember spending, you know, an hour and a half and, and you know, somebody would call or my parents would pick up the phone or something and I have to start all over again. And then, then Z modem came around and Z modem had, you know, you could resume and that was, that was the best thing ever. I mean, that, that changed, changed everything. Yeah, because file transfer protocols have really kind of fallen to the wayside in comparison to compression protocols. Mm -hmm. You know, compression protocols still are a huge deal. And in fact, compression, you know, it's one of those things of the Huffman guy doesn't realize the political battle he's going to cause in the 1990s where he's got compression that starts to become an accepted way of data transfer, you know, and then MP3s come along whole new can of worms. And everything goes to crap. You know, they created MP3s in 1989. I knew they'd been around for a while. It took them three days to digitize one second. Really? That's the kind of power they had. So, um, yeah, very useful, huh? Um, so, are there, are there, Well, I actually started calling it before I was a member of CDC, but I think actually my my upbringing as far as BBSs was a little bit different than a lot of people, I think, because um, although I wasn't there, you know, I first started, the the first time I called the BBS was in 1986. Um, so I wasn't there in the early 80s. Um, but uh, I was, when I first started getting into stuff, it was sort of like I was, I felt steeped in the lore because text files, I was, um, the my first awareness that BBSs even existed were, were through text files that, on a disc that my cousin gave me. Um, and I remember going through the list of, uh, you know, we had a modem, so using, getting the modem and hooked up to the computer and then going through the list of phone numbers um, at the bottom of this BBS, and none of them were still up. And actually the first, the first, first BBS I think I ever maybe connected to, or first or second, was probably um, Dark Side of the Moon. And I didn't call it again back for a long time, but it was one of the very first I ever called because it was at the bottom of this list of, uh, on a text file. And it just happened to be the one that was still existent. Um, as far as Demon Roach Underground goes, um, I wasn't a member of CDC at that time, and because I was so into text files, um, I looked at them sort of as the premier group that was still active, as opposed to things like Anarchy Inc., which was um, really my first introduction to text files. Um, so I called... Um, Demon Roach Underground, DRU, and uh, um, would talk to the CDC people on there. That's how I got to know them. And that's probably eventually how I got invited into the Cult of the Dead Cow. Yeah, a little bit easier to get with CDC in the beginning than it is sort of the middle here. Yeah, well, I, I really think that uh, we need a bunch of new members. I, I honestly think we need a whole bunch of new blood. Um, but before that, we need to do anything. <laughs> Something, anything. Well, that's the problem. out at the top. And going out towards, you know, other projects, other things, archives, you know, history, people, whatever else interests him. You know, there's that sense of that. Um, I think, I honestly feel that CDC has a lot more to give. I think that um, 
which is why it bothers me. If I felt like, okay, you know, we're done, we're tired, we have nothing else, nothing new, um, I wouldn't mind. But the, what's frustrating to me is that we, that's not the way it is. We have, you know, there are people have text files they want to put out, we have projects we want to do, but it's a matter of getting ourselves organized. Because CDC has always been a group of tremendously creative, very intelligent people, um, but not very well organized. Um, you know, we're all very independent people. We've all got our own things going on. And now as we get older and we have lives, you know, people are married. The first CDC baby was just born. Um, it, CDC has, has stopped being, you know, my number one priority like it was when I was 17 and um, dropped to pretty low on the list, but it's still there. It's just a matter of getting our shit together, so to speak. One of the things that really struck me that a few times that I've dealt with um, CDC's um, presence at hacker conventions is that there really feels, like, maybe I'm just my own personal perception because I'm friends, but there really seems to be that sense that there are like very few other people get such a rise out of just existing in a place. I mean, Steve Wozniak, um, you know, Emmanuel Goldstein, you know, and, and, and the list gets low, maybe under a dozen people, that their very presence changes the nature of the room. You actually see people shift in the room. And, you know, there were and have been other text file writing groups. There have been other program writing groups. There have been other groups that have made, but there seems to be this strong scent. And do you think there's any particular ingredient that led to this? You know, I honestly don't know. I think that um, it, you know, I could, I could give the, the, the canned answer, which is just, um, you know, we are powered by eliteness. CDC is the rock stars of the computer underground. But that really doesn't say anything. I mean, um, I don't know what the answer is. I, I don't know why that is. I think that all I can think of is that maybe the CDC represents something that, whereas every other or most other groups, um, say the hacker groups, all they did was technical stuff. And text file groups, maybe all they did was release text files. And, and so... I think CDC is a bridge that isn't that common in a, um, the history of, of the computer underground and that we, we weren't all about either. You know, we were a lot of people who, who ha were, you know, very skilled as far as computers or computer hackers or whatever, but, but um, CDC wasn't necessarily the venue for that technical side of, side of them. But, uh, I don't know. It's a mystery. I have theories for my book, but you know, there's separate, separate, separate conversation. I book. Um, you know, was there any BBS you heard about that you wish you had been on? There were some of the. Um, some of the older ones. I'm trying to think of specific examples. I know there are, there are certainly ones that, that I've heard of. I'm like, oh, you know, that sounds cool. Maybe some of the original, like, LOD boards. I can't think of specific names right now. Project. Yeah, the project. Um, you know, I was, I came in at the very tail end of the AEs, you know, like Metal AE and things like that. So I was, I was on those very briefly. I, I think I'd, I would have liked to have been on, seen them in their heyday. Um, but, uh, I think I, I feel very lucky to, I feel like I came in at the beginning of sort of the golden age and went out at the end of it. Maybe, um, maybe that's, you know, I'm colored by my own prejudices and my own um, experiences as far as that goes. Maybe I miss the golden age. It just seems like that to me because, because it's when I was there, but uh, um, I do feel that way. Is there... Um there a quintessential or in terms of the sysops attention to his BBS that strikes you? Hmm. I don't know. I mean, the works 
maybe because I mean the, when I was first on the works it was the one that you'd written fair at BBS um, so that's that's pretty personalized um, and so when things if something went wrong or whatever we talked to you because you wrote it and you could fix it <laughs> or, or at least write around it um, but it, but I didn't really see that on on dark side so much, even though it was written by by Tom, uh, by Tom Dell, and he ran it. Um, personalized attention. I don't know. It, it's really the works was the BBS that I called the most that you were most likely to be able to get to talk to the sysop if you tried to chat him. But that's just because Dave was always home, and. Um, because it was always crashing, he constantly he constantly had to do stuff to it. So that you know, it's not like like Demon Orch Underground for the last six or seven years of its existence just ran on an Apple II GS in, in Swamp Rat's closet at his parents' house. You know, he didn't have to touch. He didn't have to do anything. Um, the works was a lot more high maintenance than that. It constantly had to be had to be tweaked and and, and fixed. So that required personal personalized attention. Um, Yeah, I don't. I can't think beyond that, like uh, of, of things that had a personalized, personalized touch so much. I mean, there were lots of BBS where the BBSs where the sysop was a, a vibrant part of the you know the community on the BBS who posted and, and and took part in conversations and things like that. And there were lots of BBSs where the sysop was totally hands off and was just like, okay, you know, do whatever you're going to do on my BBS. We just provided it as a sort of public forum. Well, the the uh, the, the traverse question. Argus, I think Argus, because Argus was very clearly something that was aimed at being um, a commercial. It was, it was obvious from the very beginning that it that it they planned to develop it into some sort of commercial en enterprise, um, because you, you can't just run a, a sixty line BBS for the hell of it, um, unless you're some eccentric rich person or something. Or Andy Rubin. <laughs> okay. Um, Wait, did spy did spies have sixty lines? Six. Okay, six is different or than. Eight. Eight, 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 eight is different than 60, though. Eight lines free, running on a Unix box, 1985. Anyway. Uh, and it was, but it was, it was the beginning of, you know, you saw, like, BBS with, like, rules of conduct. It was like, oh, you can't do this, you can't do that. And so, you know, our immediate response as little punk kids was to do everything that they told us not to do. <laughs> and, you know, steal people's passwords and, 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 um, knock people offline and chat and things like that. So your perception is, um, I mean, is it just a clear case that you equate commercialism on a BBS with being a poor BBS? Well, I, I think I, I think so, yeah, because I think it spoils the whole idea of like a community. Like for me, BBSs were communities. They were, um, and once you introduce anything like when it's run by a commercial enterprise, they don't have any interest in. It's not in their. It's not in their interest. They don't get any profit out of, you know, providing a community unless unless they're selling you something or it's supporting something specific that they can sell you. You know, n nowadays you see forums on, like, video game websites, and sure there are people there that all know each other and all talk, but it's provided as a form to su to support a profit making enter enterprise. Yeah, there's a bunch of. BBSs out there, or forums that are out there that are in adverse reaction to the commercial product, like the Alphaville Times, which is the anti-Sims page where people are on Sims and trying to run whorehouses on the Sims. I've heard of things like that, yeah. And they're discussing how, like, it's gotten to the point that the Sims Online censors and prevents anyone from saying the word Alphaville Times. Really? Yeah. See, that's not cool. Well, that's because they're pushing, they're pushing that kind of logo, which is kind of interesting. I, the closest thing to a traditional BBS that I've seen on web, that I personally have seen on, on a, in a web format, was a, um, when I was living on Treasure Island in San Francisco, which is like a, a very sort of like small community. Um, and there's a, a forums, you know, web forums site that's very much like a BBS. It's people who live on the island or people who are, asking questions about the island there's no there's nothing commercial about it it's it's 
Um, so when I lived on the island, it was a great resource. Now that I don't, I don't necessarily go there and talk about Treasure Island or anything like that. But uh, when I lived there, it was great, and it was definitely a community thing. You know, people had parties or would invite people to parties on the BBS, etc. cetera. Um, now, you were never a CISOP yourself, right? Never a CISOP, I was the co. Um, no, yeah, because if, if I was going to run a BBS, um, it would have had to been one of those, you know, like, you know, we're up from three in the afternoon when we get home to five in the afternoon when moms get home. Um, because I didn't have the money for my own phone line. <laughs> I didn't have a job. Um, it wasn't until after I'd already, you know, after I was like 18 or 19 and, and well out of my parents' house that I had the possibility of running a BBS. And at that time, I didn't feel the need to. It was, it was like, I, there were good BBSs out there. People, other people were doing it. I didn't need to, to do that. Nice. I could I could be a Kosis op and have all the power with none of the responsibility. <laughs> Admin D is your friend. There's a, you know, I mean, um, as, as you've mentioned, Tewksbury is a physical place. Is there some... Boy, howdy. Is there some... Uh, I mean, if I'd grown up in Alston or something, I don't think I would have needed to turn to that, to BBSs as a an outlet probably. So, look, maybe it's a good thing. It's a, it's a positive thing about growing up in Tewksbury. Who knew it? Yeah. Just like, you grow up waist deep in water, you're going to learn how to swim. Yeah. So, great. Works for you. And um, why are people always drowning in Burma? Riddle me that, man! <laughs> Cow man. Riddle me that. That's it. I'll use that somewhere. Riddle me that. Um, is text files absolutely um, I know it's a passion of yours but I think that it's such such an important thing and uh, you know to I think it's textfiles.com is an incredibly important thing I'm very glad that you've done it because nobody else was doing it you know there were there were CDs of, of text files and collections and stuff but nobody made a concerted effort to collect everything and I think that text files are the permanent record of that time it's you know, it's it's the the Dead Sea Scrolls of of my youth. Is there any kind of um, person that you met or knew primarily through the BBS that had a huge effect on? You? Oh, there's a lot. There are a lot of people. I mean, there's you. <laughs> there's lots. There's um, Swamp Rat. Uh, a lot of the CDC people. Um, Tom Dell, who I didn't meet until, at, you know, a decade after I, he had a big effect on me. Um, too many to count, certainly. There are lots of people who shaped um, my upbringing and shaped the person that I am today. That's separate. That, that was actually one specific bomb hit. <laughs> yeah. He's a botanist now. It's crazy. Yeah, he thinks he's a botanist now. He actually no. thinks he's a bush. Um, <laughs> Shrub, actually. No, it's actually it's interesting. I think my I've always been interested in archaeology, things like that. But my going into it, like looking into going into it as a career, is more a response to you know I sp I've spent the last ten years doing computer security and computer work, um, and I don't want to do that as a job. I'm fine doing that as a hobby, but I don't want that to be my job. Um, it makes it less fun. It I don't. I don't want to do my hobby as my job, really. It's you know, once you once it becomes a, a business, once it's the way that you make your living, it's it stops being fun and becomes a responsibility. That's the reason that CDC has never and would never become a company, and that's why I think that the Loft guys, from the very beginning, I said they they were crazy to to um, become a you know to become a company, and I think that the results of that have borne out my skepticism, and that you know it dissolved. No, it didn't dissolve. It really exploded pretty spectacularly. Um, you know, some of them still have jobs there, and I'm I I I bet they're happy. I bet they're 
I assume they're happy there, the ones that still have jobs there, but the community, the, the, the organization that was the loft, it, it killed it. And I think that that's, that's terrible because those people could be making just as much money off in different companies. Well, the other... They had to sell out their friendships. It's chapter 22 of my book, but the, uh, you know, one of the side effects is not just that the, that the coalition, as it was so named, was blown apart, but that half of them are at each other's throats now. Literally would not be willing to be in the same room. No, it's re and it's really sad. I, I, you know, I ran across that recently when um, we were at my birthday party. At, at, uh, at Golgo's house, and uh, I invited Mudge, and Mudge was like, you know, I really want to see you, but I can't, I'm not, I'm not, I don't want to see you in that, that venue. So, you know, I, I still have to, I, I'm planning on hanging out with him when I come back from, from England, but uh, um, I was like, okay, you know, I can respect that. It makes me sad. Um, I'm, it makes me sad that, that, like, it's like when the original Loft kind of fell apart and Count Zero wasn't invited into the Loft version 2 or whatever. Um, and he and his best friend, you know, they were best, best man at each other's wedding, et cetera. And they had a falling out. And now, you know, they're sort of, you know, they've, there's been a reconciliation to some extent, but see, it, it all goes bad when you, when you introduce money, introduce business. I, there's, there's been so I remember especially around the time like back orifice came out and stuff I'd get requests like people asking for information like how do they invest in CDC and it's just like buy a t-shirt <laughs> I don't know I'm like what do you mean like we're not going to be selling shares <laughs> or anything although that would have been kind of humorous just because <laughs> what are they buying a share in yes we'll give you a portion of our profit raise that. yeah raise venture capital and spend it all on monster trucks and hoes well, that Napster book that I got, that tells very specifically how just enormous amounts of money just poured in. I mean, enormous yeah. amounts of money. Um, but it just, again, it destroyed the friendships of the people who built Napster. I mean, Jordan Ritter and, and Sean Fanning don't like each other anymore. You know, it, they, and it's, as, as hackneyed and trite as it may sound, I think that um, money is a corrupting influence in every in, without exception every single case when I've seen groups of my friends go and, and start a business or or turn you know their hobby into a business it has ended with bad blood between people um, and that's not to say that they would have been you know special friends forever otherwise anyway but um, it probably wouldn't have been as spectacular <laughs> I'd say 94. No. 90, 94. 94. That was the, the last Hohokan, I think, was the, um, the last Hohokan, and to some extent, the first Hope, which was what, 95? Yeah, that was really the last time a lot of these people came out and, and we saw people. I mean, um, Taron King, Night Lightning, um, you know, just, just all the people from, who were the, the big names from the, from the early and mid 80s. Um, just kind of once once cons sort of became more commercialized or more sensationalized they didn't have any interest in that they just wanted to go and drink with their friends and hang out with their friends right and the other thing is that there's a lot more i mean i, I find out about people who were like there's a shot in the napster book of minus and ritter and a couple others hanging out at defcon in 99. i was there mm -hmm. i never knew of them saw them met them Nothing. Well, it's too big. I mean, and that's the problem. I just remember SummerCon. You know, when when you had a small thing, the first like the first con I went to was in, what SummerCon in 1993, um, and that was just you know at, at a motel in St. Louis. It wasn't like you know it was just it wasn't we didn't have a conference room. We didn't have anything like that. Um, and then HoHoCon in '93 was the first one that I I personally went to that that was a you know had a conference room and and um, people were giving talks and, and uh, um, actually trying, you know, some semblance of, of a, 
a formalized transference of knowledge. Before that, there was plenty, you know, we were transferring knowledge, but it was like at a bar, or well, not when I was that age, but you know, in a, in a, in a hotel room over beers. Um, it wasn't so formalized. That's where you blood off the ball. Yeah, exactly. Um, and I, I think actually still at cons, that's where the, the majority of um, learning goes on is in a private setting, not you know, in, in a room with a thousand other um, kids who it's their first time away from mom. Um, do you have a specific memory of Frack magazine? Mm -hmm. A specific, like something specific to talk about? Yeah, something specific um, at the beginning when you first ran into it. Because it's one of the first magazines. It was, it was one of the, the text files. on. It was actually at least part of a, a FRAC issue. I don't remember which, maybe FRAC number eight was on like one those first discs of text files I got from my cousin. And I was like, whoa, you know, that was my first introduction that, you know, that this, that this world of, of, you know, hacking and freaking even existed. You know, I had no idea before that. I, you know, I... I knew about I think war I'd, I think I'd seen war games, but that that wasn't any more real to me than you know Tron. You know, it was um, so to find out that there were actually people doing stuff like this was a uh, I mean not <laughs> taking over <laughs> nuclear missile launch computers, but that there were actually people doing computer hacking and stuff out there was amazing to me and it was it was great because I was what 12 years old. That's a, that's a pretty big uh, world to open up to a kid. Um, yeah, as we start to round towards the end of this tape, um, is there anything that you definitely wanted to get on tape relevant to BBSs that um, you, think, you think belongs there? I don't know. I think that, uh, I hope that you've talked to people um, that just because you run textfiles.com, I hope that you haven't neglected to, to talk to people about text files. And because I think that, at least to me, that's, the, the most important um, and the most what, what we say not the most important and most real thing to come out of text files I mean to come out of BBSs um, text files captured a moment in time uh, they give real evidence of the mindset and the, the time that they're a product of. So I don't know, did, have you, have you focused much on text files? Only peripherally, only talked to a few people about some See, they're important. <laughs> you need to interview you. You can give a fake name, you can be Asen J. Otske. On, on my own documentary, I interview myself. That's, that's, see, that's the brilliance of, of using a fake name. I'm telling you, Asen J. Otske. Yeah, that's it. No one will see through it. Or you can put your name in, in ROT13. <laughs> People will just think you're Dutch. No, I'll just call myself um, Susan Thunder. <laughs> Susan Thunder. Sorry, you're not horse-faced enough. I'm, have you met Susan Thunder? Because I'm not mean. I'm, I'm just telling. I'm just telling it like it is, sir. <laughs> um, I may not be being tactful, but I'm not being mean. Mean suggests like some sort of cruelty involved, or like I'm saying something that's not true. Undue exaggeration. Fact. No, it is. She doesn't literally have the head of a horse. No. <laughs> um, as long as we have that clear on tape. Okay. I want to make it clear that when I call her a horse face... <laughs> she does not literally have a horse's head. Horse's head. Uh, to I my knowledge, I mean. To my knowledge. But however, I do want to say, Winnie. Um, <laughs> um, all right. So, um... Six foot four, horse hate face, former hooker. That's a great combination. Hoeing for wares. Hooker for wares. Where's hooker? That's there you go. That's a great handle. Um, <laughs> that's that's something that's interesting about BBS is have you talked to people about handles? Because I think that's uh, something that's interesting because BBSs were, to some extent, anonymous at least if they you wanted to be. You, know, you hear the whole thing like, oh, on the internet, no one knows that you're a dog type thing. But the the same thing is true on BBSs. You could represent yourself as whatever you wanted to, and unless you were actually going to go out and meet these people, they had no way of knowing. They they didn't know who you were. They didn't know you from Adam. Um, so handles, I think, were a logical 
evolution. I mean, the, the term handles even, even comes from what CBs and ham radios. I would imagine, I don't know for a fact, but that's what I would think it would be the... They come from there, but that even precedes... Precedes CBs and stuff? CBs, yeah. What does it come from originally? Don't know. I, I've heard it before, though. Before then. Um, What's your yeah. handle good, buddy? Oh. Um, okay. Well, I think we have it pretty much nailed. Anything else, Luke? I got nothing. Okay. Perfectly fine. All right, let me get my phone. This is Luke. He's my best friend right now. My hands are cold. <laughs> my hands are cold. Oh, well, yeah. That's why I love having the computers in the basement. They keep it from totally freezing? Well, because I don't have to worry about cooling them. That's true.